Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the session about ideas to screen insights and experiences and success stories by one of the most successful agents for um, trend or selling rights for books into films. Welcome, and I'm very proud and delighted that I have today with me Elisabeth Ruge, who is the owner of the Elisabeth Ruge Agency in Berlin. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us today, Elisabeth. Hello, Claudia. <laughs> and everybody. <laughs> yeah, you've been very successful in uh, being an editor and a publisher at different publishing houses. You set up different publishers in Germany and then you set up your own agency. Can you tell us a little bit about what, why did you set up your agency? Well, as you said, I had quite a lot of experience in different kinds of publishing houses, houses that belong to conglomerates, um, houses that are relatively small, houses that we founded ourselves, my former husband and friends of ours, um, and also family-owned houses, important family-owned houses in, in Germany. So I really did get um, to know a lot of as aspects of publishing and organization of publishing houses. Um, on the whole, I sort of had the feeling that, um, yeah, it, sometimes the things were rather slow going in publishing houses. And um, there's a big culture, I'm sure everybody who's tuning in knows this, of meetings and, um, and sitting down together, going through things, which I think on the one hand is important, but on the other hand can somehow be paralyzing. And I suddenly had this urge, maybe in, this, in these difficult times where flexibility is such, a, such an important um, part of being successful, to, um, to found my own company, um, which is small and very tightly run, and, um, and which sort of has very um, short uh, roots of communication, and there's a lot of liveliness, and not so many people involved who are doing decisions together, but still, um, I sort of had the feeling we can react to the changing times and, um, and try different policies, different strategies, and we don't always have to go through endless layers of meetings and decisions. And I think I just felt I needed that kind of um, dynamics. Mm, okay, so and that's, I guess, my next question would be, what do you like about being an agent? So that already answers some of it, right? Mm, yeah. And um, when we, when we talk about agents, I mean, where does your work start? And where does it end? Yeah, uh, that also is an answer um, to what do I like about being an agent? Um, and I really think I like the fact that um, different to some other agencies, our work certainly doesn't stop when we have negotiated a contract and it has been signed. Um, and it doesn't start with taking a manuscript and submitting it to the publishers. That is sort of a very small span of our work, um, a central item of our work, of course. But, um, but I think I've been able to funnel into my work as an agent all of the various functions I have performed uh, in the world of publishing in the past years and um, decades, I have to say. Um, and that is being an editor, being someone who's in charge of a list, of composing a list, also being a publisher um, and being an author myself and also having worked on translation. So really having been involved in almost every function um, of the publishing process and bringing that to my work as an agent. So we really do um, a lot of heavy editing in our agency. So mm. when we receive a manuscript, um, we don't expect it to be ready to send out, but we do a lot of work on the fiction side and on the nonfiction side, we actually do a lot of conceptual work with the authors. So we will 
we will ask the authors to, um, to sit down with us and really basically structure their idea for them or basically help them decide if they have several ideas, which one to pursue. Mm -hmm. So it's a very creative process with our authors, which I thoroughly enjoy. And we're very close to them, we're close to the texts. Um, we're doing a lot of work that, um, that used to be done in publishing houses. And, um, and I feel mm -hmm. partly at least is now um, um, sort of a, um, a, a component of our work as agents. And then we of course talk to publishing houses, we offer these manuscripts, we negotiate contracts and so on. But then the work extends to the other side um, by in the sense that we do accompany the process of publishing. And because I know so much about publishing houses, and I also know about what difficulties they have, um, I know that this mm -hmm. is a very, very tough time for publishers, um, as it is for all of us. And this is not only Corona or COVID related. Um, I, I really try to to accompany the process of marketing, of publishing a book in a very constructive way. So we don't um, enter the process um, with, uh, yeah, with, with some kind of thoughts or ideas um, that are just beyond the possibilities of publishers. But we really try to explain also to our authors where the limits are, yeah, mm. of what a publishing house can do and what kind of constrictions there are at the moment, um, and therefore try to really be a, 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 a bridge between our authors and the publishers whom we um, feel to be our partners. Mm, okay, so you mainly represent authors, right? You don't pre represent publishers, but authors. No, in your agency, we do right? represent, we oh. represent a small handful of publishers and, um, and agents who are located in America. Mm -hmm. um, we're very proud to represent um, Grove Atlantic, which is one of the last large, important, very lively independent houses of the US publishing scene. Um, that is a partner, but we represent them in the sense that we sell German language rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we come to films, you've been selling mm -hmm. a number of films or stories to be made into films. Can you tell us a bit about the process and how you got there, how, how you managed to be successful in this? Yeah. Well, um, we really started initially being a, a, an agency exclusively for book rights. And um, we quickly had the feeling that um, these, these Uh, traits we try to embody um, that I mentioned at the beginning, especially the, the presence that we, we try to have in the market, um, the flexibility, the um, very direct dialogue we have with, um, with publishers. Um, uh, we, we try to translate into the world of film rights when we notice that um, Film rights are um, habitually given to the publishing house in the book contract um, as one of the sub rights they acquire. And we just had the feeling that um, with the exception of a few houses where we saw a lot of um, inventiveness, creativity, a lot of liveliness and, and, and dynamics when they were dealing with the film rights of their books, we tended to see a certain amount of very routine way of handling film rights, sending out, um, well, preferably digital catalogs um, in some cases because the houses or the, the conglomerate, the publishing conglomerate was so large, it would be this huge catalog of tiny mm. little, you know, um, Uh, uh, texts of the various film rights uh, they were offering. And I really don't see um, production houses who are offered a lot of material um, going through these tiny little, you know, telephone book-like um, catalogs mm. and sort of trying to figure out what would, what would be good for them. So we decided that um, actually we can do a better job for our authors. Um, and uh, 
and we started to get to work. And I can say um, it's it's not a, um, an easy road to travel. Um, you really have to start um, compiling, constructing a network for yourself, um, adding to it con constantly. Um, which is not so easy because this is a totally different world. You have to figure out how it functions and you have to figure out how to get to know all these people. And um, luckily, um, the Frankfurter Buchmesse and other um, uh, entities have really been great partners for us in setting up platforms that, um, that get us to, to meet producers. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good to hear. And um, do you do you think that in a publishing house or in an agency, um, you need a special person just to take care of that? Because you're saying you need to invest quite a bit into networking and creating new networks, adding to new networks. Or can this be done yeah. on yeah. the side? I think one of the problems I came across in the publishing houses is that um, that they were dealing with this bulk of film rights. Um, with a person or very often several people who were just doing it sort of on the side. And mm. um, I really do think that that is a problem. I've, we've been uh, going to, to film festivals. We have been working with, uh, with mailings. And so I would say that we are in touch with a lot of production companies routinely on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. And, um, and adding to our contacts. But that really is a, it's just a lot of continuous work and a mm. kind of nitty gritty work um, of just being on the ground, so to say, that, um, that somebody has to feel responsible for, or somebody has to be given the room, the space um, mm. to do that kind of work. And, um, and that was part of the problem we felt in the large publishing houses, that, uh, that there just wasn't um, enough sort of lively back and forth. So I think one of the, one of the big um, pieces of advice I would give is to um, at least have somebody who is responsible and in charge and really try to make sure that that person, even if at the beginning the going is tough and the, and the income you're generating is not, you know, going through the ceiling, you have to have the patience and have and let that person really work on expanding the contacts and the network. Mm, okay. And can you tell us a little bit about what kind of films, what kind of books or what kind of rights you have sold for films and um, films and perhaps also TV and series? Yeah. I would say um, it's really uh, a, um, an interesting mixture. We have uh, quite a lot of um, films that are being, or books that are being developed for, for movie films. Um, but we also have, of course, an ongoing dialogue um, with, uh, with the, the larger streaming platforms. And, um, and we're, we've negotiated quite a few contracts that are now being um, moved into, um, into the production of a series. So um, I would say um, the, it's almost, I would almost say it's 50-50 by now. And that has really, um, that development has been extremely swift. I mean, it's a question not of half a decade. It's a question of one, two, three years of feeling that, um, that shift. Um, mm. and, um, and of also oneself um, being more open to, uh, to looking at the, the material you're offering, the books that you're talking about and, and, and trying to figure out yourself if they actually have potential for both or um, thinking more in the sense of series, I think is, uh, is really um, a good idea. Mm, okay. And what kind of, um, can you give us some examples? So mostly German titles or material, I suppose, right? Yeah. It's a really interesting mix. Um, on the one hand, I would say we have quite a few debut novels. So first novels that we've mm -hmm. um, brought into um, really nice film deals uh, that are now um, going into fruition. So mm -hmm. um, 
So these can be books that often have a very literary appeal, but um, but their plot lends them to um, to be turned into a movie. Um, so we have, for instance, a, um, a wonderful novel by a young author called Alina Herbing, who, um, who has written about a, a provincial kind of crime plot. Um, and, uh, and it really brings you into a world that's very rural, but is um, politicized, has a lot of um, psychological opportunities mm -hmm. for, for various characters. That's also something very important when you look at books. What kind of, um, what kind of figures, what kind of, um, what kind of a cast can be brought into this story? Um, soon we will be going out with a very large um, novel that is sort of upmarket women's commercial fiction um, with a literary appeal. And it has, it involves four generations of women. Mm -hmm. And you can just see by reading this book, um, which is also very handy because it has a setting that is pretty much concentrated on an island in the North Sea. So, mm -hmm. that, um, so that makes um, for, for um, a good opportunity for producers not having to go all over the place for different um, set possibilities. But you can see these various generations of women, how many interesting actresses can be um, involved in this book that's going to be a very big book um, of the coming spring. Mm. But we also negotiated our first deal, which is an interesting deal. Um, because it involves um, several really interesting um, partners, uh, um, was is a deal that one could say was not so successful, and that's something one also has to brace for. This is mm. not always, you know, not everything works, and it sometimes really takes multiple efforts to get something done. And in this case, it was a wonderful, very interesting, um, very thoughtful, rather also brutal um, debut novel by a, an author from Leipzig called um, Philipp Winkler, mm -hmm. who wrote a book um, called Huel that was uh, sold with translation rights by um, his publishing house Aufbau into very many countries. And we sold the, um, the option uh, to a, a great um, production firm that I very much cherish, X Filme, and, um, and to a wonderful director whom I totally admire and adore called Maria Schrader, whom we all know, of course, because she's the director of Unorthodox and, um, and just won an Emmy Award. And, um, and she was very, very interested in this material, but she had tons of work to do, for instance, unorthodox. And she just didn't get around to getting a grip on mm -hmm. the material. And, um, and Philip was extremely patient and waited and waited and waited. And then finally we decided we have to see if we need a different partner. So, um, so now the material which had been of interest to so many production firms has now been moved to Weidemanns, um, which is a smaller, independent, but extremely um, successful public, um, production firm mm -hmm. that, for instance, um, is the, they're the producers of Systemsprenger, which was one of the most important um, German films in recent years. They have taken up Hul now. They might speak to Maria. I'm sure Maria has tons of work to do now because all of Hollywood is interested in her. Who knows, maybe she will return um, to this project with a different producer. Um, perhaps we'll, we'll find other directors who are interested. Um, it's just, you have to be flexible, you have to be open. And I think you are successful if you're always thinking in terms of the success of the material you are offering. Mm -hmm. That you're not going out there and looking for production firms and then thinking, oh, what could I, you know, press onto them? But that your vantage point is the material, looking at the material, making creative, intelligent decisions of who might be the best partner for this specific book, for this specific plot, for the opportunities that um, a book has to offer. Mm, okay, so you're saying first look at the material that you have and uh, develop something out of that and then look for producers or directors. You're talking mostly to producers, right? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. we mo mainly, I mean, we know quite a few directors um, whom we're friendly with. And of course, it's just great because um, talking, I mean, just talking to people mm. who are successful in a creative way um, in the film world uh, just gives you a ton of ideas. So, you know, you don't, you should be having a lot of conversations that don't immediately um, translate into turnover or income. Mm. Yeah, you have to be open to take up ideas um, like a sponge. And, um, and that will, in the end, I think this kind of intelligent communication and networking um, and this kind of independent creative thought uh, then does translate into, into your success. But what often happens is that, um, especially in our dialogues with production companies or when we are, um, we are negotiating um, a contract, which often, for instance, um, in the spring, one good example is Jasmin Schreiber's Marianengraben, um, the Mariana Trench, which we pitched at the at Books at Berlinale during the past Berlinale. Um, there, it, it's very typical because we were talking to very, very many production firms. It was a really long process, which had to do with COVID and people going into home office and battling with the first shutdown. But nevertheless, I've experienced that these this process always, if you're doing it in a good way and making a good decision, it tends to be a long process because it often involves bringing in your authors, going into meetings, this year, of course, they were Zoom meetings, and we had we had about a dozen production firms or more interested in the Mariana Trench. It sort of slowly boiled down, and at the end, we had five Zoom meetings um, that were repeated by by further Zoom meetings. And one um, of the production companies who actually um, then optioned the rights and the author Yasmin Schreiber decided to go with them. From the beginning, they brought in the young female director mm -hmm. who would be um, a part of their package. And funnily enough, or interestingly enough, um, and this sort of um, stresses my point, the production per firm we were talking to is a small firm from Luxembourg and I mean, they were competing with really, really big pro producers mm -hmm. and um, and their offer was not the highest offer by far. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had an offer on the table that was really mind blowing. But um, but I had met him talking about uh, about Bernard Michaud, this producer of Zamzafen. I had met him in Cannes at a party, a German Austrian get together um, where I spoke to him and sort of while I was speaking to him, thought, this was about two years ago, I really want to do a, a film with this guy because he's a real reader. He talks about books, not in the sense of material, but he really reads books. He loves literature. Mm -hmm. And I was always thinking there will come a day where this sensibility that he displays will translate into being the best producer for a book I have to offer. Mm -hmm. And it happened. And it also happened because he brought in his director, the director was going to write the screenplay. She and our author, Yasmin, got on so well that they're co-writing the screenplay now. Oh, and okay. we have a, a very wonderful package that, um, that came together by being very patient, very precise, and really putting time into this process. Mm. Wow. Sounds really exciting. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, since you were talking about Cannes, so are those, like the Frankfurt Book Fair, the Berlinale, uh, Cannes, are those the main um, locations and festivals for selling rights and doing the pitchings and things like that? Or are there, or, or do you do the most deals not at those festivals? Well, I, as I was saying, I would we don't do the deals. I've very rarely at a festival done mm -hmm. a deal. Um, but uh, it is an, an amazing, amazingly good place for pitching. Um, and we tend to really, we've really invested in being at all these festivals if we were offered to be mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. given a, a place where, where we could um, 
meet people and um, and and do the pitches. So um, so we've been participating in Cannes regularly at Venice um, at the Venice Film Festival. Um, we always participate in the Berlinale and we're constantly in dialogue with the Berlinale to try to figure out if there might be a, a more visible platform for book publishers um, besides the main pitching event, uh, Books mm -hmm. at Berlinale. I think mm -hmm. that would be something that's very helpful. And I think it might be easier to get this these things done or expanded because I do think that um, we are going into a world concerning the festivals, the right selling at festivals, and also um, the, the fairs, the big fairs that will be conducted um, or characterized by more digital events. I think mm. even when the pandemic has somehow been brought under control, um, which I don't think will be the case in the coming year. I think next year will still be very tough and, and we'll have to sort of just make the best of it. But, um, but even then going into 2022 or, or later, I think um, for, for money reasons, just for financial reasons, mm. I don't see the, um, the CFOs of big publishing conglomerates sort of you know saying we're gonna spend all that money again. Um, mm. And I don't see people who are maybe more conscious of, um, of ecological subjects. And I do think that's a big topic that's arising in our world, um, mm. that people feel we really have to go all over the place um, to meet each other. So I think one of the challenges is going to be to, to make sure we can meet in person. I do think that that still is a hugely important part of, um, of how we humans interact. Um, and Zoom meetings, even if they're, or, or, or chat rooms or whatever, are never going to be able to make up for, for not being able to sit mm -hmm. down together, yeah? But I do think getting people together to, to talk about rights, I think it's very important that for instance, also for people coming from countries where it's just not possible to do all this kind of travel and invest so much money. I do think it's going to be important to offer platforms and we will be using them and also going to places in person as far as it's possible. For instance, Toronto is something that we've always said um, we would uh, be interested in. And I think uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair is thinking about um, a possibility there. So, um, so that's something we're very keen mm -hmm. to, um, to expand on. Mm, okay. Good to hear. And uh, when we talk about the pitchings, can you tell us uh, a little bit about how you prepare your pitchings? What is a what what is a successful pitching, or what is the most has the best outlook for being successful? Mm -hmm. Well, I think coming out of the book world, and I'm talking to book publishers here or book people, um, I think it's really important uh, to, uh, to look at your book, the material you are offering and detach yourself from the, the, the judgment you have of this material as a book. You really have to look at it in a different way, in a creative way, and see its opportunity as a film. That means um, I had already mentioned the characters involved. You have to bring across that these are really, really interesting characters that producers can offer to interesting actors and actresses. That's one thing. You have to be able to very quickly tell the person who's listening to you, the producer on the other side of the table, what the narrative arch is going to be. That is very important. Um, a book can be fantastic because of the inner monologue and all kinds of things um, which are absolutely unimportant and actually distracting to a producer when you are introducing this material to him. And, um, and the other thing is that um, you have to give a pitch that lets the person who's listening to you see pictures, images. You have to somehow, with a few clues, with a few details, with, um, with a, a few words, 
have a, an image arise um, so that you're translating immediately the, sub, the, the, the material you're talking about into a succession of images. And, mm -hmm. um, and all of that you have to do in, in quite a short bit of time. So one thing that is important is that you really prepare. You don't go into a pitch and just start talking. You really have to have an idea. You shouldn't, if it's in any way possible, you shouldn't be reading a pitch, uh, but you also shouldn't try to learn it by heart. Everybody notices if somebody's saying something that he's learned by heart. You should have a few, a few sort of small stations that you might have within a pitch that you might have sort of you know, written out for you in, in, in a word or two. So you mm -hmm. have a, like a little, um, little piece of paper. If you sort of are going off track, you can see, I only have so much time. So I really have to get back, uh, you know, into, into my um, order of things here. But, um, but you should really try to, to be as lively, as natural as possible, and really have a plan when you get on stage or when you sit down with a producer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the ideal pitch is like three minutes, five minutes? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there, there's always this, this word of the elevator pitch. That would mean like something like 30 seconds or 40 seconds. And I'm sure you can you can bring something across in 40 seconds, um, but, uh, but luckily mostly you are given a bit more time, but you shouldn't okay. be rambling on for sure. Mm, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about the OTT platforms and that in the last few years, this has really, they have really become a very big, big chunk of the business, also the, your partners, right? Um, is, there a, is there a difference when you deal with companies like Netflix and regular producers, let's say? Is there something one has to, I know you probably can't go into details, but uh, is there something on the whole which you have to pay attention to? More than well, uh, very often when we're dealing with the platforms, we're dealing with them through uh, producers. So very often we're talking to a producer and they then bring in a platform. But often we're mm. talking directly with them. And the only thing I can say is um, invest into your contracts. Yeah. And really um, be prepared to... Uh, have the financial resources uh, to, to fight it out. Yeah, I mean, with time, you're going to be more experienced. Um, you uh, will know exactly what to look for, but you have to invest. Um, we use, we work with our own contracts. We don't ask mm -hmm. them to send us contracts okay. that we then have to totally get into and basically fight every little point. Um, we start with the, uh, with the contract that we want for our authors. We know that this is not going to go through, um, but with some production firms we have now, where we have various um, films under contract, we by now have a, a mutual boilerplate where we found compromises that we can live with, that the production firms can live with. And now we have something that we can work with. So mm -hmm. with several, production producers who are our continuous partners, we have a contract, but we had to he heavily invest in those initial contracts. And with, um, with large streaming firms that just have everything in place and they have their big legal teams, um, mm. uh, it's a battle. And you, for that kind of a battle, I do feel you, um, you need someone in the background um, who's going to give you advice and, um, and is going to help you figure out how far, how much space do you have that you can give them. Um, mm. it, that is just costly, but it's mm. a cost that, um, that is an initial cost. And with time, you can, the, the financial aspect becomes more, more doable. Mm. Okay, well, that's really interesting. Um, with Netflix and also with other companies, I mean, the cinemas were closed or uh, only very few people could enter the cinemas here in Germany, at least. Um, and we all heard about that um, the companies, the production companies and also the 
um, streaming platforms weren't producing any movies anymore. How did this situation, which is obviously the, caused by co the Corona virus, and did how did that affect your business in, in selling rights? Well, mm, well, I mean, um, uh, we can sense uh, we we participated in um, in the Can platform, which was um, which was very successful for us. And um, we had a lot of meetings. We just had um, quite a few meetings within the framework of the Frankfurt Book Fair where um, meetings had been organized um, with help also of, uh, of the Berlinale. That was very, very good for us. And we, we had a lot of communications, but I can say that you can feel the home office, the, the second lockdown, the, I would say the, the corona exhaustion, the COVID mm -hmm. exhaustion, in the sense that you really have to fight to, um, to then have the follow-up uh, conversation mm -hmm. after these meetings. As I said, in, in Cannes, in Venice, at the Berlinale, you don't sit down, you don't pitch a book, and then they say, oh, great, um, you know, let's, here's our offer. You really have to get in touch with people again and again and again, and you can feel at the moment, and this is something we're all going to have to be battling with for the next months to come, um, for the next year to come, you really have to put in double the effort of communication. Mm. So, um, so I can really say we're, we're working 12 to 14 hours per day, um, uh, seven days a week, uh, because we just have to reach out more. It's just um, people are exhausted by, um, mm. but what they, by what they're experiencing, not only in their professional life, but in their private life as well. And so we feel this act of communication is also an act of um, of giving people the confidence that things are going to go on. And we really have to um, keep, you know, acquiring um, projects. It's the world is not coming to an end. It might feel like it, but um, there's going to be the day where you're really wondering what is my next project and, um, and start talking about it, start thinking about it now. And I, Luckily, during summer, several of our partners on the production side really managed to um, to get a lot of their their movies um, mm -hmm. done, actually. And um, and that is because either they were big enough to have the financial resources to go into this risky situation of going on set and risking that um, something falls flat and there's a lot of money invested that's lost because there are infections and um, and the set has to be closed down. But with smaller firms who don't have that kind of um, a financial cushioning, we did experience that they, through incredible amounts of good organization, lots of testing, really managed to get things done and, um, and are now in post-production with films. But that was summer. That was those were the summer months, and um, and there was a, a lot of improvisation possible because of that. And I do think we have the the toughest stretch in front of us. Um, mm. And I do fear that um, for quite a few smaller production firms, things are going to be really tight. And I hope that um, our government, as many governments. Um, worldwide are going to be able to to help um yeah help those uh creative participants that are really really going to suffer in the in the next months mm, yeah i really hope so too um looking to asia um you are uh, do you sell a lot of rights to other countries for your authors and also about for films do you also sell a lot of rights for films which would have would be produced in other countries yeah well um we hardly ever sell um book rights internationally because the translation rights is one part of the subsidiary right contract um, uh, block in the contract that is always given to the publisher. Mm -hmm. um, they have the good contracts. This is really part of their most essential, most important work. So we really hardly deal with um, with uh, with translation in the 
in, in the field of book rights, we mm -hmm. do um, represent a handful of foreign authors which, who want us to work on their world rights uh, for them. That is Chan Dunda, for instance, the Turkish author, Viktor Yerofeyev, a Russian author, um, Philippe Pozzo di Borgo, um, a French person that everybody knows from, uh, from um, his, his wonderful, huge success um, here uh, um, in Germany. But, um, but we hardly deal with translations in, when it comes mm -hmm. to books. And with films, I must say, we, um, we have quite a lot of international con contacts and we're really interested. And I was talking about a Luxembourg film producer that we um, sold rights to just, um, just now with the Mariana Trench. But that really is a rare thing. Um, we've have, we have the uh, experience that we talk to German producers who very often quickly bring on um, international co-producers. And mm -hmm. that's how we have dealings, but not directly. I think mm -hmm. uh, because we mainly deal with uh, German materials, um, we are talking to people who are looking at it for a German market, and then they bring in uh, co-producers. And very often, they're very successful with that. So that's interesting to us, but we are not a direct um, partner in that process. Mm, okay, I see. Yeah, um, and uh, I was, when I was thinking about series or material or films from Germany that have been very successful, one of the most successful ones, I think, was Babylon Berlin, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's also That's an great. interesting story, yeah. yeah. Why do you think yeah. that became so Uh, famous in Germany and also worldwide? Well, of course, I'm biased. Um, as uh, everybody listening might know, I'm sitting in Berlin at this moment. Um, I love Berlin. I think it's just one of the most amazing places in the world. But it's been that for, for several decades. And I think it's, it's not coincidental that in the title, um, of this of this amazing series, uh, the word Berlin, the name of the city, turns up. I think Berlin is a city that um, has a very very real life in that we're experiencing here, but it's also um, become a symbol for so many different things. And um, and we we sold a uh, we sold a, a really amazing book that we also pitched at the Berlinale two years ago, and which is now being developed into a series by by a, a big Berlin and Hamburg based um, production firm, um, which uh, is situated in Berlin um, in the 60s, and it takes up so many topics that are important to so many people in the world, um, but it all sort of comes together and is focused in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So the student uprisings, the Cold War, um, spying, everything is in there and it's all within this, this one space in the world called Berlin. And I think similar things um, apply to Babylon Berlin or when you mm -hmm. think of one of the great films of all times, Cabaret, yeah? You suddenly have this one place that stands for, for so many things, individual liberty, for, for freedom, but at the same time for very dark forces um, and, and this constant struggle. And, um, and it's just a world that is full of the most amazing characters. And I think that's true of the series Babylon Berlin. I mean, they're just mm. these characters you'll never forget again. And they're from all wakes of life, from all social spheres, from the political, from the cultural, from the demi-monde uh, sphere. It's all there and it's all in Berlin. And I mm. think... If you, or my experience is, if you tell someone in New York you're from Berlin, they basically are saying to you, which I think is questionable, wow, you're best from the best city in the world. <laughs> I think New York might be a runner up too, but um, even in New York, people are just amazed and in awe. Mm. Um, when you say you're from Berlin, it just mm. stands for so much. Oh, okay, yeah. And this uh, this series, Babylon Berlin, was also made by from a book, right? I mean, uh, yeah, by Volker yeah, Kutcher. Yeah, sure. It's a series so. of books, mm. and um, 
And I think, uh, I mean, there are many books that deal with this period, this time. I think there was a surge of books because of the, um, the success of uh, Volker Kutscher, um, the author of, of the books that translated into the series. Uh, but I do think that Volker Kutscher is so knowledgeable um, and has such a, such a, a mastering uh, way of dealing with historical facts and translating them into, into a suspense, suspenseful mm. narrative that um, he just brought this, the, the mm. perfect mix. And, um, and as I say again, it's just full of amazing characters mm. and they were there. And I think the people who saw that and could connect them with certain actors and just get an idea, as I say, see an image of what, you know, what people will be seeing on the screen. Um, that, that the books just lend themselves to that, mm. um, that process. Yeah. Okay. That was, uh, that's also quite an interesting success story of German um, content mm -hmm. that yeah. was made into sure. films. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've almost come to the end of our session. Um, but before we go, I have still some more questions for you. Uh, one of them would be, what do you say, um, what does it need to be a successful agent? And what does it need to be a successful agent in pitching film, rights to films? Mm -hmm. I think um, to be successful as an agent, but... Um, in so many ways in the book world, in the film world, where the competition is big, but um, things are really not so easy at the moment. Um, you have to have a lot of genuine enthusiasm. I think uh, people, when you sit down and talk to people, they people have a sense of things and they can feel if you're really, really interested and enthusiastic in what you're offering them or if there's a certain amount of strategic enthusiasm you're displaying, that is just, it's palpable. Mm. And, um, and I think that is important, but then you have to combine that enthusiasm with precision. I'm a great um, fan of precision. Um, and, uh, and, and also, as I said, you really have to be in for the long haul. You have to know that this is going to take time. It's going to take time to get your network together and expand it continuously. It's going to take time to really feel the impact, um, the turnover that you're generating for your company with film rights. Film rights in that sense really do not uh, give you um, immediate uh, financial success. That just it's a really long process. And we all know that many, many of the rights that you have optioned then do not translate into films. So you just have to hang in there. And I think you have to have that kind of a mindset when you, when you begin and you just have to know it's gonna take a while. Mm. Okay. Do you have any more tips for publishers uh, from Southeast Asia who are listening to the session? Mm -hmm. I think it's um, I think it's very important to keep your eyes open for opportunities um, of digital um, communication that will be offered. I'm sure um, in greater and ever more technical perfection in the coming years um, by people like the Frankfurt Book Fair, other big book fairs by the various film festivals. I think um, this is something that's going to be really important. It's going to really give a possibility to smaller companies, to smaller houses to participate in an international network. And, um, and I think you, you really should um, look uh, at these opportunities and just go into... Um, these um, areas and, and test them and, um, and stay with it. Uh, I think that um, there's going to be, there's going to be a surge in business that is uh, conducted on these platforms and that comes into fruition, I'm sure of it. And uh, it really is an opportunity that um, one uh, should try to grasp. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for being with us here today and sharing your ideas, knowledge, and your experiences and talking a little bit about your own experience with selling rights to film. Yeah, thank you very much, Elisabeth. It was a pleasure talking thank to you. you. And thank I you, hope Claudia. We it really hope was I've an honor and it was a really lovely conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I hope we will be able to welcome you in Indonesia, maybe in the next yeah. few years. Yeah, that would be great. I would be very interested in coming. All okay. right. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Dengan informasi terkini Menjadi sumber referensi dan inspirasi di setiap aktivitas Melalui news video portal Segala informasi dapat tersajikan cepat, akurat, dan lengkap Dengan kekuatan teknologi digital Mytcom.id Hadir dengan berita pilihan yang dikemas secara menarik Mytcom.id Digitally inspire people Sudah 15 menit, masih kejebat macet. Tenang, tenang. Daripada emosi, 15 menit Anda jadi lebih berharga kalau bersama saya. 15 Minutes, setiap Rabu, jam 6 sore, lewat 45 menit. MediaIndonesia.com hadir dengan opini cerdas dan narasumber kredibel. Mudah diakses, informasi berkualitas ada di genggaman Anda. Klik di browser Anda www.mediaindonesia.com Dan temukan pandangan berbeda Karena fakta bisa sama Sudut pandang boleh beda Mediaindonesia.com Views and News Dalam setiap denyut kota, saya selalu menjadi saksinya. Disiarkan lebih dari 20 televisi jaringan Jawa Post Group. Jawa Post TV, paling Indonesia. Kebebasan pers dan gelombang era digital menghadirkan ribuan bahkan jutaan informasi dan data setiap harinya. Beragam data dan informasi berserak di berbagai tempat seiring dengan perubahan dunia yang bergerak begitu cepat. Media-media baru pun bermunculan namun kualitas informasi seolah tak lagi menjadi prioritas. Bahkan tak sedikit yang abai pada etika jurnalisme. Untuk menjawab tantangan itu, Kata Data hadir sejak April 2012 sebagai portal media di bidang ekonomi dan bisnis. Beragam sektor diulas mulai dari finansial, energi, pangan, hingga industri kreatif dan digital. Artikel mendalam dan komprehensif dengan sajian infografik yang menarik menjadi karakter utama dari Kata Data. Kata Data beritiar untuk terus menyajikan beragam informasi berkualitas untuk kemajuan negeri dan untuk kepentingan bisnis Anda. Kami percaya demokrasi yang sehat tumbuh dari kehadiran informasi dan data yang akurat. Kalau bicara pakai data. Hidup terlalu pendek untuk membiarkan pemikiran-pemikiranmu, ide-idemu terdiam begitu saja. 
Untuk berubah, kita perlu melangkah. Dan langkah itu lahir dari sebuah inspirasi. Republika Start Moving.